we've been working with the, the virtual computing lab, the VCL project for a little while, and um, that's what I'm going to talk about. So first, let me just, I'm going to go over uh, what the VCL is, what the VCL can do, and then get into some of the details about how it works and what's going on under the hood. So in a nutshell, the VCL can do a lot of different things, but what it primarily does is it, it, it gives, it dynamically will provision a dedicated computing environment for a user. They can make a reservation for some sort of environment. Uh, the system will, will make that available to them and, um, and it's theirs for, for a while. When, it's, when they're done with that, it goes away. Um, <clears throat> secondly, it brokers access to this, so it makes sure that certain users can access certain types of resources. And then it does all of the orchestration involved with making sure different, uh, different pieces of the puzzle are in the right places. This is, while it's not limited to um, colleges and universities, most of the use and certainly the history of the VCL is really, really focused on its implementation at a college or a university. Um, basically, you have these institutions and they have, they have computing resources that they want to make available to students. Primarily, this is going to be site licensed software that's expensive, potentially. Uh, that they want to have, they want to give access uh, to, to the students. So, typically, the way this works is you have a computer lab. You have a physical room with some number of machines. This is our CS lab at Amherst. It has 23 machines. Uh, so, you've got kind of a hard limit on the number of, of students that, that can use that very effectively. We have another, another lab, a biology lab. This has software specific for the biological sciences, chemistry. It has 12 computers. We have a GIS lab. We have eight computers. Again, this is a, these are small labs. This is a small college. Um, but that's, that's what it is. And this is, this is the typical way that colleges and universities make these resources available. <clears throat> it's a little more complicated um, because there are five colleges right in our, in our valley. And uh, so students at one college will take classes at another college and there's a whole system for this. Uh, you know, the, uh, so Mount Holyoke is down here and Amherst and UMass and Smith and Hampshire. They're, they're pretty close, but it, it, it takes a while to get around. And um, if, you're, if you're a student at, down here, and you're taking a class up here, and your class up here requires access to a certain set of software that's not available at your home institution, well, you're kind of stuck. The, there are a number of issues that, that come up. Um, aside from just the physical distribution of these resources in the traditional setting, um, you, get, you get other kinds of issues uh, related to these lab environments. One is, one is uh, putting different versions of the same set of software on a, on a particular image. So one professor might want this version of MATLAB and this, this person wants that version of MATLAB. Well, you can't have those on the same image. Um, you end up, again, with different um, strange combinations. This, this type of software conflicts with that software. So again, you, you, have to, you have to keep some of these specialized software packages separate. Um, but these are, these are things that, um, that conceivably are, are all very solvable, especially with some of the technologies we have available. Uh, for instance, virtualization. 
where we can where we can begin separating these images. Um, this is one of the, the main things that, that the VCL makes available. Can, can we dynamically provision these, these environments for, for students, for faculty, for any user, make them available from any location and at any time? Because again, com physical computer, computer labs typically have a, a locked door during certain hours and just because of, of staffing concerns. And, and furthermore, we need, we need a self-service interface so students or any, any type of user can access these resources, him or herself, uh, without, without needing to understand network topologies and understand how, how any of this structure is, is really working. They just, want, they just want a list of the environments that they need to have access to and, and the ability to make a request for that. So from a user's perspective, the way this looks is we have a web interface. And then from that, the user simply makes, makes a series of, uh, um, of requests through forms and so on. And, and to them, there's just, there's just a cloud. There's just a pool of resources um, to which they'll connect. This, you'll have a series of nodes um, which, will, which will run the environments that they, uh, the, that they may want to have access to. And these, these nodes can be distributed across different hosts, different hypervisor environments, um, different physical infrastructures. Um, and then in terms of how this actually works, So here it is. Again, there are five institutions. Um, the authentication here is fronted with Shibboleth, which is a federated authentication system. Um, so anyone who comes to this is first going to have to say, OK, well, which institution are you coming from? Uh, it'll send them on to an identity provider. Shibboleth is just a. Um, it's, it's an implementation of the SAML security um, markup language. We'll see how fast the network is for this, but um, so here I am. I'm in the virtual computing lab now. I want to make a new reservation. And here I have a list of different environments that I can choose from. Uh, here's ArcGIS. It has some statistical software, some GIS software. I can identify whether I want this reservation right now or whether I want to schedule this in advance. I want it right now. And then at this point, this sets off a process uh, whereby some some provisioning is going to happen. This this usually th at this point it usually takes about 20 maybe 30 seconds to handle all of all of that behind the scenes. At which point the user is presented with you know, the ability to connect. Um, in some cases, uh, in some cases an image might have to be loaded up from scratch. In which case it would take considerably longer, the image would have to boot and, and, and such. But, but here it is, it's ready. <clears throat> we connect to it. Now it's doing, it's doing a little bit more uh, background orchestration, opening up the firewall, etc. cetera. Um, this is just gonna be a Windows 7 image. And um, with, again, with some special software, it's, it's, at this point I connect to it over RDP. So, here we have, um, we're just standard RDP remote desktop. There you go. And I have complete control over this image now for the next hour. Um, any, if I want to print from this, you know, again, it, 
this is just RDP, so printing is forwarded over that channel. Uh, any, any network disks that I have uh, that I've already connected to are forwarded through that channel, so I have access to those inside of this environment. Um, at this point, it's just, you know, you, you've sort of, the, at this point, the VCL gets out of the way. Um, now, if your image were a, uh, a Linux image or something, you would probably connect uh, with SSH or some other mechanism. And that can all, all be defined. Um, That's just a default. Um, when I, so if I go back here to my reservations, I can extend it to, you know, can make it a little longer. When I, when I originally make the, the reservation, I can, uh, right here I have a duration. I can request that it's 10 hours or however long. For, for certain users, um, you can identify how long they can make a reservation. So certain users might be in a group where, oh, they can, they can make a reservation for three months. Whereas other users, you might only allow them to make a reservation for an hour and then you can only extend that up to, say, four hours. Again, that's, that's really in terms of how you control the, um, the, the, the um, resource pools and, and um, who has access to what? <clears throat> yes? You offer network access to, for some file shares so that the users can store something there when the image is gone the next time they're all in it, another one. Yep. Get access to whatever. So, um, okay, so first you, you're raising a good point because these are all non persistent I images. And when you're done, anything that was stored on that image is gone. Um, so this requires a bit of, um, you know, so again, over, over RDP when you are, um, when you're forwarding these, these network drives, um, typically users will store any data that's produced during that session on those drives. That way it persists across sessions. Um, otherwise, you know, you can um, potentially um, have access to you know network shares inside of the, the remote environment. Uh, it's just a little bit complicated because you know again you have in our case we have five different institutions and then you have to make sure that uh, the firewalls for each of those are open in each of those those things. Those, those, those are some areas where if it's necessary it's it's entirely doable, but you would need to define that on an image. On, on an image by image basis rather than having the VCL manage that for you. Let's see. So, um, one, one more thing before we continue. So this, the idea here is that this, this interface is simple and straightforward. Um, the VCL has, um, has a remote API which allows you, if, if you don't like this, you can, you can uh, make your own. Um, for example, um, you know, this is just another interface to it. Um, this is just a little jQuery uh, a jQuery thing. You'll notice my reservation is still active. Uh, if I want to make it longer, I can. Uh, if I want to make a new reservation, again, really easy. You can, you can embed this into other systems. We have this embedded into the, uh, the course management software, so students don't even touch the VCO website. They just make these reservations from within uh, the context of uh, the course management software connect to it, and 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 they're done. They they don't even they don't even go 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 to these uh, the, this this website. So how this works? So first, 
a little bit of terminology um, in, the VC, in the context of the VCL. When we say an image, we're talking about a whole computing environment. This can be just a simple VM, sort of like what I showed you earlier with uh, where you have one operating system with some specialized software on it. This can be a, um, this can be a cluster of, of VMs or physical machines. Um, it can be a, a long running server. It can be a lot of different things, but basically it is an environment, uh, it is a specialized, sort of well-defined environment that has been made available to a user. Um, a reservation, users will make a reservation for one of these environments, again, for a, li for a certain limited period of time. Um, and then the resource, there, there are image resources, so resources that, that define these environments, and there are computer resources, compute res resources where, you know, on which these environments are run. <clears throat> so again, effectively you have these, these three different groups. Every, every user is going to be part of one or more user groups. Every, uh, every image is going to be part of one or more image groups, likewise with the, the, the actual computers. Um, within the VCL, you have, you have mappings for how, how all of these um, interact. So then, so not every user will have access to every, um, every image or every, every physical computer. Typically, you might have a small group of users that have access to certain images and other images that are available more widely. <clears throat> the basic architecture is fairly simple. You have a web interface, you have this scheduler. The scheduler is basically a database. Um, what that does is it, 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 it controls who can make reservations when. It makes sure that if, if your entire infrastructure is currently maxed out, that the next person who comes to make a reservation is told, well, there's nothing available now, but at, at 345, you can make a reservation. The other important thing about the scheduler, and this is really key for academic institutions, which is that um, you have classes. You have 40 people who every Tuesday morning at 10 need access to a particular environment. So you need, you need those, those nodes ready to go at 10 a.m. Uh, without a whole lot of waiting around. So it manages all of that too. Um, the main thing about the web interface though is first we're, we're, we're gonna handle authentication. Um, like I said earlier, there's, there's a shibboleth based um, authentication built in. Um, for those of you who attended Oliver Wolf's talk yesterday um, about authentication in the cloud and authorization in the cloud, it's, Shibboleth is basically the same kind of thing um, where you can handle, where you can do federated authentication. The application itself is entirely unaware of certain user passwords um, and it's, it's considerably more, more secure than LDAP, which the VCL also supports. Um, also, the system does, does all of this access brokering, so which users can access which images. Um, down here again, the scheduler, we have that, that monitors the state of all of these nodes. Um, it controls and, and makes sure that any new reservations can, can fit into the system and be, uh, um, and be available when the user is, is uh, wanting that. And it also handles and manages these, these larger block allocations. The next tier down, these are, these are um, management nodes, which you can have one, you can have lots of management nodes. Um, they can be distributed physically, however you want to do this. But these basically listen to the scheduler. 
So when a new request comes in, one of them will pick up that request and then begin processing it. The, this is the layer really where all of the orchestration happens. Um, these are going to control, they control all of your, your, um, your host infrastructure, which might be bare metal, it might be a, uh, some type of a VM infrastructure. They'll also reach into the, the actual nodes and control them and, and manage the state of those nodes, making sure that users can, can access the nodes, user accounts, privileges, firewall, these types of things are all um, managed by these, these management nodes. The other, the other piece of the management node is typically all of these will connect as well to a shared a shared image library. So you might have certain images that are available here on this host and other images that are available on that host. And at times it might become necessary for, for images to be moved around and, and made available elsewhere just because of uh, changes in, in the nature of the demand of, of a particular image. Down on this next level, again, we have, we have different host infrastructures. The, what, what the VCL supports at present is, um, again, bare metal provisioning, uh, VMware, various, various flavors of VMware and versions, um, VirtualBox, KVM, um, sort of OpenStack, there, there are some people who are using this with OpenStack, um, and uh, better support for that will is, is forthcoming. Uh, there's certainly been a lot of interest in um, seeing how, how the VCL could sit on top of CloudStack as well. <clears throat> so these, these hosts, the, the way the way they the way they are going to operate again you, you can have one host you can have several hosts hanging off of each management node those hosts are going to um, they're going to control all of the the running nodes and in a, in the virtualization context what you'll have are, are um, master golden masters running available on the host which are which are going to be persistent and non-changing, and you'll have a series of linked clones running on these nodes. So that's how that's how this non-persistence is supported. Uh, a user will access a, a node. Uh, nothing will will be changed uh, against the the master copy, and your um, you know just the the, the non-persistent changes are all are all partitioned in, and put into a particular particular space and then when they're done it, they're all gone. <clears throat> the layer at the bottom with these computers again for a given image you can have one computer one VM one cluster however however that ends up being defined um, you can run various, it, the VCL supports various operating systems, um, Windows, Linux, high performance computing. Um, there are, there is a, there's a guy at, um, F at Fullerton who, who basically got this to work with um, OS X as well. You have to run it on OS X hardware, which has some limitations, but, but it's possible if, if you really want to do that. Um, but again, these are all these are all going to be non-persistent. So, if something happens to the VM, uh, the user would simply make another reservation for the same image. It would come up, and um, provided that the, that that the data has not been um, stored on that VM, nothing will be lost, um, except for perhaps some processing. Um, and state issues, some state things. So once a reservation has been made, like what I showed you in the demo, the, uh, the web interface will provide some information for the user to connect directly to this, this compute node. 
over RDP, over SSH, however it's defined for the image. Um, they'll have access to it for that period of time. When that time expires and they'll, they'll be notified once they're getting close um, to do such things as save their work and, um, or, or extend their reservation, which, which are both possible. Um, but once, once they're done, the compute node is d effectively destroyed and, it, and it's returned to the pool. Now, if you make a reservation for something and you never connect, well, or, or you connect and then you disconnect and you're idle for a certain period of time, that too will cause, cause that, that compute node to be returned to the pool. Basically, the idea is that if you're not using these resources, they'll just go back into the pool. So using these linked clones is, um, is really nice for, for user access, but when it comes to updating your image, um, adding software to a particular image, or otherwise making changes to your image environment, then what happens with that and how do you do that? Um, the way the VCL the way the VCL operates with that is when you, when you initially set, set up this, this environment, um, there will be a series of base images. Um, and by base image, what, what that means is you might have a Linux image with nothing particularly special with it. Then there might be a Windows 7 image. Again, no, no applications are installed. It's just Windows 7. Maybe you're running XP as well. So you have a series of images with, with nothing on them effectively. When, when someone wants to create a new image, uh, something that would, that would actually be used in the, in the context of the VCL by, by a student or a faculty member, um, what happens is you, you create an imaging reservation. So then rather than reserving a linked clone, you, you, you do a full clone of, of this virtual machine the user is then given access to that full clone. You make whatever changes you want. You might, you might need to install, say, MATLAB, or whatever, whatever the software it is that you, that you need to install. And when you're done, you go back to this web interface, and you click a button, and that kicks off a process by which the image is um, Sort of, there, there's, some, there's some cleaning that, that takes place. For instance, with, with Windows, you're going to defragment the hard drive, you're going to clean out some temporary files. Um, there, are different op, there are different operating system modules defined in the VCL that handle different OSs differently. <clears throat> once, once that cleaning process is, has completed, the OS is shut down, um, and then, and then your host, your your hypervisor is going to uh, have to define you know some process by which you're co you're going to copy the virtual disk into this area of of golden ma of golden master virtual disks, and at that point your image becomes available or your image becomes in this pool of of images. You can there there's some there's some workflow that that has been defined so the user who's created that image can then go through and test it and verify it and once they define once they they say that it's it's ready for production they can define that in the context of the application and then at that point users can access the image We, in, in our use of the VCL, we've, we've you know, again, Amherst College is, is it's a small place. Um, but we've, so our infrastructure isn't huge uh, for this. But uh, what, we have, what we have been doing is we, we've looked at how this performs under load um, with certain spikes. Because again, with the VCL, you're going to have kind of a, a, a low load of these ad hoc reservations where someone who, just like I did earlier, comes along, says, I'd like a reservation right now. It loads up. 
that the load from that tends to be consistently low, um, and this is you know just for for our our experience. And then you'll have these courses where you need a larger pool of um, of images available all at one particular time, where you have a sudden spike, and um, your infrastructure needs to be able to handle that. What I found is that the I/O latency was really the, the bottleneck that we ran into initially. Um, for v within the context of VMware, we had, um, we had all of our golden masters on, on one data store, and then we had all of the, um, the workspace where new images are being spun up all on a different data store. Uh, once we put that workspace data store on faster disks, uh, all, all, of the, uh, all of the issues with I.O. latency just dropped. And, uh, and at that point, what we found is we could begin oversubscribing mem on memory and on, on CPU. So our infrastructure, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm oversubscribing RAM by about 20% now. Um, which, which allows me to have more machines available, uh, you know, than I would otherwise anticipate. Um, we have everything running in uh, in a vCenter cluster, so, you know, this this requires the uh, the VMware uh, enterprise license, but VMware then can can do do some load balancing. So certain VMs that are that are running rather hot can be moved around according to, you know, across different physical hosts according to what makes the most sense um, for particular processors. So the VCL, uh, last summer we, uh, we graduated from the incubator into a top level project. And um, there are a number of a number of people around the the country who are using this uh, in production right now. There are there are a couple of, of directions that we're we're specifically specifically looking at uh, in the future. One is uh, one is being able to uh, to to pop into EC2 so that once if your infrastructure gets becomes overtaxed. Uh, you would be able to provision a new um, a new VM or a new a new environment inside of um, the Amazon cloud, for example. There's been a little bit of work in this direction. Um, we're looking to do more. There there are, there's an existing user base for OpenStack, and uh, we're looking to bring that into Trunk. Uh, we also want to make make it possible to, for user for end users to provision um, a, a full VMware infrastructure so that the uh, ESX operating system can, can be made available to an end user. Uh, that isn't so much very urgent uh, in the context of Amherst College, but certainly at um, North Carolina State where, where um, the history of this development has, has started, there's a lot of interest in that, in that direction. Um, a policy-based broker tool. By this, I mean um, defining defining images in terms of RDF, and then you can. From what I showed you, when you have a list of ten, 10 images or so, a user is going to have no problem figuring out which one they want access to. But if you have a hundred images that you want to uh, look through and, and decide decide uh, or, or pick one out from from a long list. Something a little more nuanced, where you can you can search and, and constrain your options, might be fairly handy. And this this will involve just uh, publishing publishing image metadata in RDF, and then you can use some type of a um, Sparkle type service, maybe uh, Apache Jenna or some such triple store to manage to manage that. Um, and then finally, managing power uh, inside of VM, VM infrastructure. We'll see. So, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, 
Um, the only reason we're, we're focused on OpenStack is because there are some people who are using OpenStack and they've, they've written some modules for that. Um, I think that, that, that uh, building in an interaction uh, with CloudStack would be, would be great and fabulous. We would just need to uh, find some people who are dedicated to doing that. Um, it's written in PHP with JavaScript. Um, it's um, so it just connects to a, a, a database. Um, an earlier version supported Derby. Um, I, the present version requires MySQL, but the actual database technology isn't particularly important. Um, but and that runs all on the uh, the Apache web server. Um, for for particular images, um, typically the the owner of a particular image is going to define RAM, um, networks you know minimum network speed, different things that relate to a specific image. The user isn't going to have control over um, how much how many resource or how the type of resources allocated to a given image. But the creator of an image does. But the user is exposed to that kind of details are only the operating system that they can They are. Um, like they can say, I want a small image, or I want an image with these particular apps running on it. Mm -hmm. Those options are provided to the end user. Or? Those those are provided to the end user in that um, in that they're given a, a, a title and a description. Of, of a given environment. Um, where I was describing this, this um, RDF based brokering tool, that would have this that would have the metadata of image size, you know, disk size, um, RAM, et cetera, et cetera, where a user would be able to choose that. How are you dealing with network isolation for your end users, i.e. of student one, student two, both provision of Windows VM, mm -hmm. uh, could those, are they in the same broadcast domain? Can they see each other? <clears throat> um, so, they, so each, each VM has a, a public and a private network interface to okay. the VCL. The, the private interface, um, they're really not going to be able to access. Um, that, that's, going to, that's going to be an interface between the management nodes so between the management nodes and these compute nodes. Um, a user on this node is not going to be able to access a user over here on this node. But if they're on the same node, they can talk to each other? They wouldn't be on the same node, because each, each node is dedicated. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, you used term. All right, so I was, going, I was assuming that the compute node was actually a hypervisor or something. So. Yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, User one might be here, another user would be here. Um, you're never going to have multiple users on the same node. So on the same host? You can have them on the same host. Sure. Yeah, so, so. So can you see network traffic on the same host? Um, and if not, how are you isolating them? That is a good question. Because if you have to isolate them from the same host, then you can't isolate them from the same host. Can I run TCP dump on? Node one and see the traffic that's passing out of node two and node three. I don't think so, but I don't know. Okay. I would need. To, I would check. But you're not passing. You're not passing anything about users down to the underlying hypervisor or cloud management platform. No. It, for all that knows, it's a single user making all of the provisions. Right. So there, there's, a, there's an internal user that's going to be making those requests. Um, the user who connects is, is going to be provisioned 
um, you know, in an ad hoc way. So there, right. that's created. But I'm, I'm talking about on the hypervisor. As far as the hypervisor is concerned, there is always a single user making yes. requests of the hypervisor. Yes. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that I don't hijack your uh, RDP session? Um, we don't. guessing you're assuming a little more trust in this environment than here. Right. And, and right. Completely down the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, are you, um, typically are your VMs authenticating against a you know, LDAP or Active Directory or are the you VMs are not. Cred? You provision this type of machine here is the username and password you we are we are provisioning the machine, and then we are just randomly assigning it a password. The password is valid only for that session, for that okay. so it it's not touching any network services. Um, you know where you're where you'll be sending user user information. You talked about linked images. Are the images and the nodes always in the same location when you look at the five? Even if they're close together, you don't boot over over the network over the one. Um, so the way we, yeah, I mean the way we have our our system set up is we have we have basically two sets of infra, we have two major management nodes, you know, at different across a couple of different you know two different campuses, um, and then each of these controls a series of of nodes. Um, so any node within a given infrastructure would, would you know, sort of reside within that. Um, if you were going to be doing a, uh, a, a cluster reservation, it would, it would pull nodes that were all within a, a given unit. Um, so I know many enterprise customers don't exactly the same different mm -hmm. right. approach. Uh, when it comes to Windows, they're all fighting with the license problems, how do you solve that? Do you have a special license agreement with Microsoft that you can mix this around? Um, that has, uh, so the licensing issues um, are huge. You have to, um, so basically the way it works is um, if you have a, it's sort of assuming that you have a site license. Um, you can, you can have a, a Mac key, um, which would be a single key that's then defined inside of the VCL for a given, a given institution. So every time that Windows machine is brought up, it will be validated against that key. Or you might have a KMS server, which, is, which would be a network server against which you're activating. So then whenever the node is brought up, it would, if, if you know that that node is, is part of this institution, you would query that institution's uh, KMS server, it validates. If it doesn't validate, then you have an inactive key and then it doesn't really work. So you have to have, you have, to have some mechanism for, um, you know, for OS licensing. Um, typically, typically campuses have some sort of a host, you know, a site, a site license for Windows. And, um, and there's some type of infrastructure for that in place. Cool. Anyway, uh, thank you. Yes? There's not an internal billing engine included so you don't charge the difference. <coughs> Uh, no, and that's 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 the part. So if we were to do, you know, when we get to the point where we're doing um, this this popping out into into EC2, that there has to be some some way of managing billing okay. or some type of. I mean, you know, I mean, there's a lot of statistics that are kept, and you can look through these statistics and find out hourly usage and such. Okay. But but that's that's not so well defined that you could use it for billing.
Thank you very much. Thank you.